My name is Elizabeth Bro. I lead the Bond Veterans Project at RUSI. And I'm thrilled to be talking today with Kevin Casasamora, the Secretary General of International IDEA, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance based in Stockholm. Now, Kevin is well known in, uh, in the world of democracy promotion. He has a PhD in political science from Oxford, and he then went on to become the Vice President and Minister of, uh, of National Planning in Costa Rica. And he is uh, exactly the right person to be talking about the con talking to about the connection between coronavirus and the state of democracy. And this video interview is part of a collaboration project within RUSI and the MSB, the Swedish National Civil Contingencies Agency. Now, Kevin, I know that you have uh, said many times that you're concerned about the state of democracy in connection with coronavirus. And uh, it, on the face of it, it doesn't seem like there would be any connection. So, so where do you see democracy in danger? Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for, the, for the opportunity. Um, there, are, there are several issues that connect the current emergency to the state of democracy. I think uh, by now is clear that just as the pandemic is uh, bound to have, and it's already having, a massive economic and social consequences, it will have a very considerable political consequences. I mean, the, 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 the most obvious manifestation of this is the, uh, the expansion in the use of emergency powers by governments all over the world. Uh, this is something that is a, a it is very it is it is a complex issue because a, emergency powers are part and parcel of pretty much any democratic constitution in the world a democratic governance a, governments are a, a entitled to invoke and to uh, deploy emergency powers in the face of an extraordinary set of circumstances such as such as this pandemic uh, this has to be done in a certain way uh, for uh, the use of emergency powers to be compatible with democratic governance. They, they should be uh, proportionate, they should be uh, temporary, they should be subject to strict oversight uh, uh, by judges and by uh, legislatures. And they should be strictly connected to the nature of the emergency that, that you're dealing with. And uh, the problem is that in some cases already, we are seeing that the use of those emergency powers is going beyond what's reasonable and what's compatible with democratic practice. Um, and we've seen cases ranging from Hungary to El Salvador, where a Quite frankly, the, the the use of emergency powers is is uh, is being uh, is being done in a way that suggests that there's a power grab uh, behind it. And, and to me, you know, one of the most telling signs of this is when emergency powers are used to crack down on the free press. Uh, the, the nature of this emergency is such that one would expect that a, 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 one would hope that as much information as possible is circulates through society so that people can make informed decisions about their, their, their well-being, about their health and so on. Uh, so whenever emergency powers are used to crack down on, on the on, on media, a this to me is very suggestive that there's an authoritarian intent uh, behind. So that's that's one set of questions. Then you have uh, another set of questions which is connected, which is in a way uh, yet to materialize, which is connected to the quite significant uh, political consequences that will stem from the mammoth economic crisis that is engulfing the world. This is a, 
likely to become very significant for the next few months in, in many places in the world. And in many places, it will generate a, a, even public order a, a problems. A, you know, rioting, looting, a, a different a problems that will in turn feed into the narrative that you need to employ emergency powers in order to deal not just with the public health crisis, but public order. So, I mean, it is a variety of, of, of issues that should get the attention that they deserve in terms of their impact, or their possible impact on, on democracy, which by the way, even before the pandemic, democracies all over the world were uh, facing significant headwinds. So this adds to the stress that democracy was under even before the pandemic. So in, in essence, a combination of, of governments that might have wanted to, to expand their powers anyway, and governments that uh, are feeling compelled maybe to expand their powers simply to deal with the magnitude of, of challenges of, from the public health crisis to uh, public unrest that, that is, is coming in, in the wake of, of uh, coronavirus, um, which sort of, uh, sets us up for, for another perspective, which is uh, what do we uh, do to make sure this doesn't become a, uh, a, a recurring phenomenon whenever there is a major crisis, because there will be a similar crises in the future. If it's not pandemics, it will maybe um, the extreme weather events or, or hostile acts. So, so how do we make sure, how, may, how do we make our democracy sturdier in, in times of crisis? I mean, look, there's, there's one important uh, fact about all this, which is that uh, this is early days. I mean, uh, in, this, in this crisis, I mean, this will go on for a while. And truth be told, in most cases, it, the democracies that have invoked emergency powers uh, have done so, so far, in ways that are adequate. Uh, we won't know uh, who has used and who has abused those emergency powers until uh, it's some time from now. Uh, so in a way, you know, ask me then the question about emergency powers in a, in a, in a year's time. And by, by then, we, we, will, we will be able to tease out the good cases from the bad cases. So far, I would say, that the majority of cases uh, look fine. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have to be vigilant, quite to the country. I mean, we have to make sure that uh, countries remain within a democratic, uh, uh, you know, with the, within the, uh, the canons of democratic uh, practice. Um, what can be done? M many things, I mean, one, I mean, I have the impression that is, uh, you know, these days, naturally, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, and there's a stronger emphasis in, in, in pointing to the risks and to the dangers to, to democracy. But uh, one silver lining in all this is that, that the sheer magnitude of the crisis opens up a very significant opportunities for democratic renewal as well. If there's one thing that this crisis is, is a, a rendering absolutely evident is the very profound fault lines that crisscross our societies. I mean, the social fault lines, the economic fault lines, the political fault lines. Uh, in many ways, uh, at least, you know, a, a, a lot of democracies are not uh, compatible with the sheer levels of inequality and exclusion that this pandemic is laying bare. Uh, and again, the magnitude of the crisis is such that I, I have the impression that a lot of countries will be forced to go back to the drawing board and rethink their social contract. And by this, I mean uh, that they will have to rethink the 
okay, the distribution of burdens between groups in societies, the, the relationship between state, society, and markets. Uh, and we're seeing that in, in many places. I mean, in, one of the things that has become brutally evident for the past few months is that the, the very steep price that societies pay for under providing systematically uh, basic public goods, particularly healthcare. And you know, when you see a Prime Minister Boris Johnson, a staunch conservative, coming out of the hospital, is singing praises of the NHS and calling the NHS the uh, Britain's a, a most important national asset. Well, you get the sense that the discourse, the prevailing discourse might be changing and that a long overdue rebalancing in the relationship between uh, states and markets is already on the way. Hence, I would, I would hope that from this crisis, a many, many efforts to rethink that relationship and to put it on a, on a different footing it will emerge. I mean, that it, things like a fiscal pacts, a, a social pacts of the, of the kind that often emerge as a result, a, a, that, that, that often emerge in the context of a, a post-authoritarian situations, of post-conflict situations, a, will emerge as a result of this. A, if that's the case, and if countries can activate the institutions necessary to have that sort of wide-ranging, broad-based political and social dialogue, then we can, uh, you know, once the dust settles, uh, we may be able to have a more inclusive societies, a more fair economic structures and more democratic political, political systems is by no means certain. I mean, there's an opportunity, but uh, the alternative is possible. It's equally possible. I mean, the, the, the first road, the road of a, a, you know, a major crisis leading to a new and better political equilibrium was more or less what happened in Western Europe uh, in the wake of the Second World War. But the alternative, which is uh, that uh, countries are not able to have that sort of social and political dialogue is what happened uh, during and after the Great Depression, in, in which case the result is darkness. The result is authoritarianism. The result is violence. The result is anarchy. So it is incumbent upon all of us that care about democracy to, to do what is called for from speaking up to nudging others into action, to facilitating a information about good practices, of, you know, when it comes to social dialogue, to do all that, to make sure that countries travel down the, the, the road of social dialogue rather than towards the, the democratic breakdown and authoritarianism. Well, let's hope for that uh, new social contract to, to win and, and for the, the road of darkness to, to vanish. Kevin Casasamora, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for the great work you're doing at International IDEA. Thank you so much, Elizabeth.